Welcome to the Everyone's a Critic Movie Review Podcast. I'm your co-host, Bob Zerl. With me, as always, is professional film critic, Sean Patrick. We are at IHateCritics.net, Everyone's a Critic Podcast.com. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Our handle is Critics Pod. We're trying to be more active there and participate more in the conversation. Uh, the trailers are there. Uh, the movies we're going to talk about in the upcoming week are there. Anything funny we think that we saw. I, I posted a funny Frank Stallone thing in our Instagram stories where he badmouth critics. That oh, was amazing. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Sean's reviews are there. It's just a, it's a lot of content there. We're going to try to keep more as well. You know what I love is the idea that Frank Stallone would be uh, like – Silly enough to like, oh, I hate critics. I'll listen to that. That's the one I like. <laughs> Fortunately, we changed our name. <laughs> Not at the website. That's true. <laughs> He'll like me, though. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that later. Uh, we're on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Alexa, Stitcher, all your podcatchers. Subscribe to the show, rate and review the show. Uh, we'll read your reviews on the air. Try to give us a five-star review. It would be nice to get those going again. And then Patreon. I hate critics.net slash Patreon. It's the absolute best way to help support the podcast. Uh, there's also a PayPal link there if you don't want to commit to more than one payment at a time. And then we have podcast merch. If you want to you know, show your love to the podcast and wearing our swag, uh, take a picture. We'll share it on our social media sites. Uh, all at IHateCritics.net. What am I forgetting? I think that's everything. Yeah, sounds like everything. Uh, we're recording the next two weeks of episodes in the same night, so just keep that in mind when you hear these two. This one will be a little bit shorter, maybe. I guess you never really know with us. Yeah, you never know. Uh, but we'll start with uh, Ford versus Ferrari, the second trailer, I think. Yeah, I think this is a better trailer than the first oh, yeah. one. Uh, I think this is giving us a little bit more of a range of what we're looking at. Uh, I'm still, you know, not necessarily prepared to feel any kind of sympathy for Ford as a as any kind of underdog, but if anybody's going to win me over a little bit, it's going to be Matt Damon and Christian Bale. So right. That that's uh that's pretty much where I'm at on that. Right. Yeah. It's funny when you. Yeah, it'll be if the movie can really make me fall into it and just kind of lose the idea of major companies <laughs> as <laughs> underdogs or overdogs. You know. Yeah. Uh, that that'll be the key to that movie, but like you said, Matt Damon and Christian Bale are the type of actors that can do that. But yeah, there's not a whole lot of trailers this <laughs> week. Not really, yeah. It's actually a slow time for movies, so it's amazing we have two podcasts worth of content. To be honest, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, we worked hard for that cut. <laughs> we yes, we did. And then, I mean, next week one movie, Abominable, comes out, and that's it. So. We're going to skip and do it all tonight. The number one movie so far, we're recording a little early, is Downton Abbey. Really? How much? Uh, it's at $17 million already. Crazy. Well, I mean, it did sell out Thursday night in our in our area, which is weird to me. I don't... I <laughs> Let me let me just start off by trying to paint a picture, and I'm painting this picture in the, in the written review as well. Imagine if, like, 30 years from now, somebody pitches you a story where... We're going to spend the day at the Jeff Bezos mansion. And the big thing is is that the Republican president is coming to stay. And the first lady, they're coming to stay at Jeff, Jeff Bezos' mansion. And we're very concerned about whether or not Jeff Bezos' family is going to – and his staff are going to make a good impression on the, the uh, first lady and the president. Do you give a fuck? About that story? Does Jeff Bezos <laughs> die and you can't tell if it's poison or murder? <laughs> no. Okay. No, the only thing at stake, there's nothing at stake here other than maybe a slight tarnish of reputation is maybe what's at stake here. Or, and and again, a big subplot, very important. We might leave, we might leave Jeff Bezos' house because there's just not, it's so big and there aren't enough servants. Ugh, I'm telling you. This is the story of Downton Abbey. This is what this is. is that they're so, this is the big drama that we're supposed to give a fuck about, is that the king and queen are coming, and the reputation of Downton Abbey is on the line. Oh, wow, stakes could not be lower here. Then, of course, there's the idea, well, what if we, I mean, there's just not enough servants, and Downton Abbey is so large, whatever shall we do? Fuck you! Get me my torch and pitchfork, for fuck's sake. 
screw this movie. I don't understand what it is about opulence porn that that people get off on. I really don't because it's just it's just these people rubbing richness in your face. Hey, look what you could never have. <laughs> I have a feeling this anger is going to carry over for the rest of these two episodes. <laughs> Do you like the show? Have you ever watched it? No, Were you into not, a, it? not okay. a once. And I understand that maybe you're spending more time with these characters. You probably know them better and uh, you know you care about what's happening to them. Like I know one of them, his wife apparently on the show was killed in a car wreck or something. Great. Whatever. I get it. <laughs> Fine, I, sympathies, whatever. Maybe that humanizes them in some way, but it, there's nothing human about them here. I don't care about these problems. These are not problems that anyone can relate to. And even the downstairs people, the 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 maids and the, their problems are not anything that are all that interesting. They're just so enamored of the idea of being able to serve the king and queen. And it's just like, oh my god, it made me so mad. It would be like as if the staff of Target was just so excited to see the mayor come in. Like, screw you. <laughs> it's just so awful to to people who don't have anything and to pretend that they were there's I mean, maybe again again, this, this is our reaction to celebrities, which we would get excited about. If we saw a celebrity, we all kind of turn in awe and wonder, fine, whatever. But the celebrity is not in charge of you. They don't get to tell you what to do. If a celebrity is a dick to you, you can turn around and walk away from them. Whereas the king or queen or the, you know, others can can fuck with your life if they want to, you know. And that's what just makes this so ugly to me. Yeah, I mean, I definitely was never going to see it. I'm not the audience for this. I dev- didn't really care for the show. I didn't really watch the show. I'm, I'm going to get a lot of hate for this. I am well, really going to get a lot well, of hate yeah. for this. People like the show. I they don't... do. I, I, don't, I don't know what it is that they love, but they do. They love this. And the crowd at the end, uh, uh, when, at the end of the screening I was at p- clapped politely. I hate when crowds clap at movies. I, I've mentioned that before, but uh, they're not there to hear your applause. <laughs> And it's always like three people that do it, and then maybe four or five are like, well, "I guess we're doing this now." And then, <laughs> and then it either dies there or everybody goes, and doesn't matter. I'm annoyed the whole time, regardless. <laughs> uh, it does have a good Rotten Tomato score, so maybe we're just not the well, audience. You know, I, I mean, I, I, I'll credit the production design is phenomenal. You know, it's a great looking movie. It's exceptionally well made. The story, even for. Somebody who doesn't know these characters is very easy to follow, but <laughs> I just don't care. I don't care about these problems. These are not actual human problems that anybody should care about in this day and age. And you know, it's interesting. I don't know how old Downton Abbey is, but it's it's interesting to think how much our culture has changed a little bit since this movie since this started, and kind of worshiping at the altar of this type of wealth and privilege was kind of something we could do. When now we're we've got the you know this over this rich overlord as our president, it kind of seems out of fashion to to worship the rich now. Yeah, I mean that's <laughs> it is. I think we're going to get to that throughout a lot of these movies. Uh, how culture has changed since the All Star came out uh, over the next episodes. That's interesting. It's funny too because this is the, Julian Fellows didn't direct this. He just wrote it. He's not. Somebody who does that kind of level of hands-on. He doesn't direct. He's a, he's a writer, and and he's he writes with a great deal of charm. But uh, there's something there. I I think it's Robert Altman is the big difference. Robert Altman makes such a huge difference in making sure that there's an actual something to be interested in all the time. Whereas here, Fellows is just worshiping these characters the same way that everybody else is. Yeah, and, and I don't think I don't think that's the great thing about we'll get to it, but the great thing about uh, Altman he doesn't give a, he doesn't care about his characters <laughs> he doesn't he's not interested he's got a thing that he's doing that he's interested in and that's really far more interesting than anything in this movie. Yeah, and you know your review kind of reminds me of you know like we talked about it last week a little bit and we'll talk about it again in two weeks when the Joker comes out. How, you know, movies, it's where you're at mentally when you go to see it. You know, the critic who didn't like it, and I guess it's a handful now, was reviewing kind of social issues that this movie may or may not. It just stuff that bothered them. It was not necessarily the movie itself, because they never really got into the movie because they couldn't get past the social part that was wrong with it. And it sounds like something here, too. It's like you're saying the movie itself is fine, but it just, 
you know, you it wasn't able to swallow you up enough to make you ignore things that bother you about yeah. it. Well, and, and again, to 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 attack the movie specifically and the script, and uh, not necessarily just the cultural issues, but really, you do have to have something at stake that people care about. And I just don't feel that they establish well how important uh, the reputations are. I know they, they're letting other works like Jane Austen and, and other works that have you know done similar ideas paint the idea of how important reputation is. And so they don't really have to do any of the hard work. But they're also relying on a TV show that's done a lot of that right. legwork as well. So <laughs> I don't know. And to that point, I mean – for whatever reason, TV shows seem to get a little more leeway when they do that compared to books, because <laughs> it's the same actors and actresses. You know, they're not. It's the same story, just kind of continued. So I, I get that to an extent. I, I don't know. It's I can't imagine we have a ton of Downton Abbey fans listening to our podcast. <laughs> I suppose it's possible. Uh, I, I I await your hate. Bring it, bring it on. Explain to me why this is so goddamn wonderful. I would love to understand. I would love to. Understand, and the thing of it is, the weird part is that I have to pretend to like this next week because I'm going to interview Julian Fellow's daughter about her companion book on this TV show. I planned that before I saw the movie. I was supposed to interview her this week before I saw the movie, so I wouldn't have this situation. Well, <laughs> yeah, what are you gonna do? Uh, Cross that bridge when you get to it. Yeah, uh, oddly enough, the next. Most the but the best grossing movie, the second best grossing movie so far is Rambo: Last of Blood, ahead of Ad Astra. Oh wow, that sucks. Again, they're neck and neck, right? But uh, yeah, I I had flirted very very briefly with the idea of taking my son to see this, <laughs> and then I'm like, and I was on my I was literally on my way to Ad Astra. I'm uh. like, you know what? I'm gonna make the 940 Rambo. I might just watch that. It's shorter. I don't gotta be up all night. And, uh, you know, like, worst case, I can't take my son to it. And then all of a sudden I watched it and I was like, holy shit. And mind you, we're going to get to it. We watched Rob Zombie movies the night before. <laughs> this was so much more gory than anything in those movies. It wasn't even funny. Yeah. Anyway, I go ahead. At a certain point, Rambo takes the butt of a knife, breaks a guy's collarbone, reaches through his skin. He just starts snapping it. Yeah. Not just once. He snaps it once, and then he just kind of keeps picking it. <laughs> like, it's like those scenes in the movies where you're pulling out one finger all the time, but he's just doing that with little pieces of his collarbone. <laughs> it was fucked up. <laughs> you seem genuinely rocked by this, whereas... I don't know. I I I can't be I can't be moved at all. Apparently, because I I the the last Rambo movie was so ridiculously violent that yeah. I I really uh, this didn't move me in any way. Moved. It was. Here's the. I, we can get to the plot in a little bit, I guess. But <laughs> I thought the story itself was good, to fine. But I thought the acting was atrocious, like Awful. almost. C or D level bad. I mean, Stallone was okay here and there. The some of the bad guys were okay here and there, but everybody else was just like, you know, amateur hour. It was really, really bad. Some of the direction was really, really terrible. The only thing they seemed to care about was the violence and the action, which I thought they nailed. Uh, it's basically Home Alone means I spit on your grave I, <laughs> with Rambo as a star. Am I wrong? I mean, <laughs> I mean that's not, not not all that wrong. <laughs> The the acting is mystery science level mystery oh, science three to it is a little it, bad definitely yeah that's the they uh, this movie is terrible in just about pretty much every way other than the demonstration of some violence and uh, I guess if you're into that then maybe this is something for you I don't see why you'd be into that basically the idea here is somehow Rambo <laughs> gets over what he does in, in when he's in. Southeast Asia 10 years ago and returns to run a horse farm with a family we never knew he had before. And he spends some time raising this teenager from like the time she's 7 to 17. Her dad is in Mexico. She wants to go see him even though he left the family. She insists on going and in the perfect right-wing fantasy she gets uh, you know, immediately picked up, raped, drugged, and 
and uh, eventually dies. And uh, Rambo goes down there to try and save her. He ends up on the wrong end of a thing, gets beat up, gets saved, blah, blah, blah. You know where this is going. <laughs> well, th- but that's the problem is that's not where Rambo would go. You know, Rambo wouldn't get beat up like that. <laughs> right? That's the... Exactly. That was the worst scene in the movie. Like, Rambo uh, was supposed to be the not... smartest, you There's know... a lot of bad scenes. <laughs> yeah. But, like, Rambo is, like, he's supposed to know better. Like, he just is. He's yeah. just... He's demonstrated in previous movies. He's just supposed to know better. He sees the he sees the guy who sees him, and he's like, he's supposed to know to walk away at that he, moment. He has the discipline to not... Even with a niece or something like that... Uh, not fall for that even at 70 odd years old what's frustrating about it is we talked about what was that movie a couple weeks ago uh with uh i can't remember the actors the timeline movie where he was uh oh i don't let go don't let go where i was like if they had gone dark that movie would have been one of the most memorable movies of all time people would be still talking about it now and now it's kind of forgotten about already this went dark, but it was so bad that you didn't care. <laughs> you know, it had the balls to do something most movies wouldn't do. Right. They wouldn't have killed her off. Mo- no. They would have put her in the hospital, and uh, he still would have probably could have done everything he did. And it went there, but it just you didn't care enough because it was such a – just so poorly acted, specifically by her. She was one of the <laughs> worst really – probably the worst thing in the movie. Yeah. And yeah. she dragged everybody in every scene with her down – like I mean, Stallone's not a great actor, but he's been nominated for Oscars. He was he'd be good in, or he'd be passable in some scenes, and then really bad in others. And I'd say passable's as good as anybody was. But one of the worst scenes in the whole movie was when she goes to finally meet her dad. And at first, he seems genuinely excited to see her, <laughs> right? And then he just snaps, just and was like, just like one little one little lighting change, and he turns into a psychopath, right? It's it was like so pro wrestling where you change so their jarring. hair color or something like that. <laughs> it is such a jarring, unnecessarily jarring turn. Uh, it makes no sense, and it plays no role in the plot whatsoever, other than he's the motivating factor to get her to Mexico. That's it. Then he's just done. He is just completely. Uh, useless and uh, and for fuck's sake, this is not a movie that can carry the weight of a human trafficking plot. And to use that the way this movie does, in the exploitative uh, fashion that it does, this movie cannot bear that weight in any way. It just it just comes off as just awful and wrong. And whoever filmed these scenes should be ashamed of themselves. Yeah, it was the only thing I'll even say it halfway got right, and it, maybe it's just because the bar got knocked down so low. And I'm talking low, and I like I'm a Rambo guy. Like I didn't hate four like Sean did. I didn't love it, but it was like it's a Rambo movie. So yeah, <laughs> the action ended up being somewhat fun, but at the same time and gory and gross. And if you're into that sort of thing, right? But it it, it just I don't know if it would have been one probably shouldn't have been that fun based on the whole human trafficking right. part of it Two, he kills the main guy right off at least the guy who put the mark in his face yeah. uh there's a i guess a cool scene where he's driving down the road and he drops his head out the car window which again <laughs> how long was he driving with it i know <laughs> and then he literally went home to set up a home alone <laughs> traps around his house and like I, the part of the reason I liked four okay is because it was so silly and it was violent and you know overly violent, but it was still silly enough that I could, you know, laugh at it and not take it for what it was. I don't like three at all. I'll, I'll even say, I, I just don't like three. Two is a two and one are the best, obviously, but uh, it got kind of fun. Part of mostly unintentionally, and then some of the action, I guess, was t- intentional. I mean, he cuts a guy's heart out and holds it in his hand for a while. (laughs) You can kind of see it in the trailer. Right? Yeah. Uh, (laughs) So stupid. The whole thing is so dumb. Uh, I mean, at the very least, he did create, they did create villains you want to see, you know, bisected by a knife. I mean, at the very least. And I will say the best actors in the movie were the villains. They they at least were believable, I suppose. But what frustrates me is there's so many things about this movie that should have been good. You know, 
I, I make fun of Liam Neeson movies about how I, I think I could kick his ass. I, I think Stone whip my ass. He's 5'8", 73 years old, but I still think he kicked my ass. <laughs> Especially Rambo looks like he's 6'5 in these movies because he's standing on a box the whole time. <laughs> they got that going for it. This story, you know, as a skeleton, not, you know, the writing of it, the skeleton works. I mean, it, it if you have good enough writing and good enough directing to make to really dive into that human trafficking and really make a strong story that could have worked. So in, in some ways, while it's kind of bad fun, it also could have been really, really good. And that frustrated. I mean, it had a lot of work to do, Yeah, but I, I got to say though, I just did. I, I was confused by the portrayal of Rambo. I mean, I, he doesn't seem to have carried forward anything from Rambo four. Yeah, because that was the whole thing of that was this big traumatic thing of him uh, coming back and 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 finding the will to fight again, and uh, and then going over the top in a way that even he seemed to realize, like I've gone to a place that I can never come back from, and now suddenly he's a horse farmer. <laughs> like, right. come on, man, really? And that's that's a good point because the other the previous three Rambo's are action films that are just kind of blow a lot of shit up big it, there's a much better way to do this the story is so simple he's just broken there and and somebody else comes to him and says look we're trying to deal with these cartels we need you we need the baddest man on the planet to go in there and destroy a human trafficking ring or a drug ring or whatever and he doesn't want to do it doesn't want to do it that he doesn't he goes completely insane and over the top you know, and and that's how you make this movie. You don't waste your time with this stupid family plot. You don't need her in any way. You don't need the wife, maid. Who the hell was that woman? I have no idea. She di- she didn't even seem like she was the mother of the girl. She wasn't. So who she the was hell the was aunt? She? Apparently, she was his wife, uh, but they never established <laughs> that at all. I, I really don't know how he was her uncle. They she just called him uncle, uh-huh. and they referred to that lady as aunt, but they never appeared married. She acted like his servant to an extent, yeah. or maid, but it was really kind of a and completely unnecessary. She means absolutely nothing to the plot. Right. So it's. I mean, if you want to do your story, though, it still might have to be in his forties. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I guess if you want to do this, I guess you Based could make off it. Based of what we see in this movie, I you don't could think make so. it. Well, <laughs> I, I'm trying to pull it to a real standard, <laughs> but you're right. I mean, if you want to make it like taken level good, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, in a way, it's kind of mystery of science theater fun. Uh, it is gory, but it's ridiculously so. Uh, yeah. All right. At Astra. Ad Astra, this movie, wow, what a what an experience this movie was, and to see it on the IMAX was really remarkable because there's elements here of both uh, 2001, uh, a little bit of Interstellar, uh, a, a lot of Apocalypse Now. It's really uh, an exciting experience, and it's weird to say because it's very quiet. And uh, the movie is basically about Brad Pitt as a uh, astronaut who gets uh, drafted into going on this mission to Mars. He's trying to get there so he can communicate with his father, Tommy Lee Jones, who is on Neptune. And f- coming from Neptune are these giant electronic waves across the universe that are causing uh, power outages and could threaten all of humanity. So that he's got to try and communicate with his dad because they think that he's actually doing this intentionally. And he's got to figure out why. So that's the premise. Once the, the execution is so interesting, because uh, along the way, I mean, this is a movie that that has all this dignity to it and all this like uh, you know uh, Oscar level like <laughs> dignity. Like it feels like that movie, but there's also space baboons, like violent space baboons in this movie, <laughs> and pirates. There are space pirates on the moon, and this does not feel like a space pirates on the moon kind of movie, but they pull it off. It's really fun, and it's really interesting, but it's also extraordinarily quiet. Brad Pitt's performance is completely internal. He's not giving you any of that typical uh, Brad Pitt, any of the typical movie star stuff. He's very internal. They've got this whole plot running throughout about his... Uh, 
heart rate. <laughs> He's got this heart rate monitor on, and his heart rate rarely ever goes up until it does. And when it does, it's like, oh, shit, that's cool. Okay, this means something now. All right. <laughs> Uh, that's that's a really interesting plot, the way that plays out. But then Tommy Lee Jones is incredible in this movie. Like, this is better than the fugitive level Tommy Lee Jones. He is so completely unpredictable. He's like a feral cat in this movie. Like, you're just kind of watching him going, what the fuck's he going to do? What's he going to do? <laughs> it's so amazing to watch. I loved it. I was so excited by him. He is amazing. This movie is wonderful. I I love Ad Astra. This movie is fantastic. Is it Oscar worthy or would it get just kind of fun? At the very least, Tommy Lee Jones is. I mean, he he should win Best Supporting Actor walking away. There's just no contest for me. Um, that I just think he's incredible. The rest of the movie, I mean, it is it does have that level of you know stature to it, and I could definitely see. Uh, seeing this again, I think it, maybe it could rise to that level. That's cool. I've been trying to get there. It was, I mean, I should have gone when I went to Rambo because I would have definitely seen Rambo at some point. But I just might have taken my son and that went back. <laughs> uh, he does not want to see this one, oddly enough. Oh yeah. Which I thought maybe he would, uh, even though he's a Star Wars guy. Uh, I, I want to see it. I, I like Brad Pitt. I mean, everybody likes Tommy Lee Jones, and it sounds like Nicolas Cage level Tommy Lee Jones. Is that kind of like? <laughs> it's something better. I mean, like it's a real. There's a gravitas to him, but there's also this like, like this. Uh, I his eyes are going off everywhere. And he just is he's very exciting uh, performance. It's just so it's so well written and so completely unpredictable. That's weird too, because the trailer didn't really. It, the trailer definitely leaned more Oscar. You know, yeah. it was more reserved. And obviously, you had to, you want to keep Tommy Lee Jones off the screen right. in the trailer. But it, it's cool that it ends up being fun, too. I, I don't know. The way it's you're fun, describing it. But it's it, also like it, it right. does have that Oscar level dignity to it. And for, for like the first hour and a half, it's very quiet, even as you do have space pirates and killer space baboons that I, I can't explain how they got there. I, I know how they got there, but I don't want to explain how they got there. There's actually a logical reason why they're there. It's really it's really cool. And it's really high-level suspense. God, I wish I directed Rambo. <laughs> <laughs> James Gray, yeah, hell of a director. He does a, a, an amazing job on this. And he can be kind of hit and miss, James Gray. But uh, this one, this is really good, uh, James Gray. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event for the linear, legitimate, and universally recognized, undisputed classic. Gosford Park. Weirdly enough, this is the this movie does exactly everything right that Downton Abbey does wrong because I think Robert Altman recognizes that these are not heroes, that these are not people to look up to or worship at the at the foot of, and. Uh, the you know their problems don't mean anything to him. Uh, a group of family in the England in the 1930s is getting together uh, for a, a weekend gathering. The all centered around the father, Michael Gambon, who's an asshole. Everybody hates him, and eventually he's going to wind up dead. And there's going to be people who are suspected of having killed him. In the end, none of that really matters. It's right. all about just the various interactions between these upstairs group and the downstairs group. You've got your upstairs group who are concerned about their nonsense problems about money and stature, and you've got the people downstairs. We've got a lot of human drama going on, you know, and wonderful human drama and drama that really means something to you. They're they're given characters to play here that are that have a breadth of experience and can make an impression in, a, in a, just a single couple of moments. Like Richard E. Grant, he steal, steals scenes repeatedly in this movie, just being funny. Uh, he doesn't really have an arc or anything. He's just really funny. Uh, you've got Ryan Philippe playing a couple of different <laughs> levels here that that is a, a really a lot of fun. Clive Owen is really great in this movie. Uh, just super cool, handsome, and suspicious. <laughs> and really, the, the ways in which... Altman seems to be delighting himself playing Ag Agatha Christie at times. It's so much fun. It, little shots of poison here, uh, a shot of a knife here. And they, he, uh, uh, just the clever ways he weaves that in without really giving it, without really lingering on it, without uh, thinking any of it's important. 
because uh, he's far more interested in just allowing his uh, his inner you know Robert Altman to just follow what interests me in this moment. It's Ivor Novello playing the uh, playing the piano. That's really what's interesting to me right now. Uh, and it's these it's these two. It's the gossip between the staff. It's you know he just follows his fancy, which is what Robert Altman does uh, best when when he's really on. He happens to have more of a plot here than he usually does, but uh, it's still a Robert Altman movie, and that's the kind of excitement that I feel watching this and. I was really surprised by the emotional level this has, because this this has got far more emotion than, than, again, Robert Altman usually has. He cares about the Helen Mirren character and what she's going through in this movie. And I, I just, I love this movie. I was I was in tears by the end, watching it again. Uh, in the grocery and, store. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 16 years later, after it had been one of my top 10 movies of 2003. Yeah, I mean... Obviously, it's good. Everything you said is true. I'm just not the audience for it. it. It's those giant ensemble casts where you have to kind of. It's hard for me to not want to care about the characters. You know what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm trying to find out who's who. And I'm trying to. I don't know if I'm not watching it right. I mean, I've. You know, this one was easier to follow than most of his movies because they're, like you said, there's a bit of a story and there's a little emotion. And I was. Everything's great. He's a. A great director it's just not my cup of tea uh more than anything but it's still i, I don't know sometimes you just don't watch a movie right and it's maybe that's what it is i'm trying to invest in characters that i that and they keep moving on to the next guy you know <laughs> and then you got this like murder on the orient express kind of story that just kind of fizzles which is in a way neat uh but you know, I I liked where it went. It kept my attention, but I just I, I get I don't know. I'm probably just watching those movies wrong. You know, after hearing you kind of describe, you know, what you just said, how he doesn't care about his characters, <laughs> and I'm trying to care too much about you know my where my head's going is not where the director is wanting me to go is what I think's happening and. In my opinion, that's more on me than the director, but I suppose people that don't like this movie would blame the director. But uh, it, again, it's a good movie, and I understand why it's good. It's just for me, it's a lot of work, and <laughs> still didn't get the job done. <laughs> Robert Altman is a director. is one of the few directors you can watch in the wrong way because he doesn't. He his way of rebelling against typical plots is to not care about the plot. He just you know, I'm going to go here now. That's what's so great about. Uh, uh, Nashville. It's what I love about Mash. It's what I love about uh, the uh, ballet movie he made a few years ago with James Franco, which is not a great movie, but he just wanted to go to the ballet. <laughs> and I was kind of fascinated by that, and it's like this—they gave him this very typical romantic plot about the the struggling dancer and the and her struggles with romance, and he's like, yeah, 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 we're going to the ballet. I want to actually film the ballet. <laughs> <laughs> just I, I adore Altman's approach in that way. The Doctor T and the Women is the same. I love that movie. That's a great enough. movie. That is a great movie. Yeah, I love that film. And it's just so he just does not care about the plot at all. He just wants to follow what he wants to follow, and I, I, I just dig that about him. Well, and there's something to be said about that. You know, in a way, it's like the comedian that walks into the room that's not, you know. And I don't care what the audience thinks. I'm this is I'm gonna do my act. You know, yeah. I'm not gonna cater to you. I'm not. I don't. If I bomb, I bomb. It doesn't matter to me. And there's uh, there's certainly a, a lot of respect in my end from that. I, I do appreciate that. And I'll totally take the blame for anything that I for just not loving it like everybody else does, or those who do love it do. Just a lot of work, and <laughs> but at the same time, that's what I appreciate about it. I, I appreciate that you know he's the type of director that does what he wants without really caring and it's just, i think as a critic you know you just long for those moments where you know you've seen so many plots play out very in ways that you recognize so so easily it's just so much fun to watch a director just just, just put his middle finger up to typical plotting and just kind of does his own thing and i i just adore that like the 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 scene the best scene in this movie is uh jeremy northam plays real life movie star ira novello and He's there with a Hollywood producer, uh, and he's just kind of entertaining everybody. He's playing the piano, and I just adore 
first of all, his singing is wonderful. Uh, Jeremy Northam is playing him is wonderful, but then the song he's playing is actually you know a, a, a very emotional in a way. Even though it's kind of jaunty, it feels kind of emotional for all that's happening. And the camera is swirling in all these various different directions, picking up on various different pieces of plot around the room, all that kind of sort of relate to the song, but not really. And then you've got the staff. That that loving staff who just wants to hear some music, you know, they just they get they get so much shit all day having to do laundry and food and never getting a rest because they have to follow these idiots around everywhere and they're just taking a minute and they're just just adoring that music for a moment. It's it's really a lovely scene and just there's so much of that in this movie. Man, it's an Oscar nominated movie. Yeah, yeah, it won the uh, best it won best screenplay and was nominated for best picture. What did it lose to? Do you remember? I don't remember. Two thousand like English Patient or something like that? <laughs> 2003. I don't actually remember what it lost to. It's all right. Uh, any other thoughts on Gosford Park? It's on, I think, Showtime? We had it for free, is all I remember. Yeah, it was on Showtime. Uh, so if you want to watch it, it's there to, to see. Uh, anything else before I move on? I mean, if you love Robert Altman, this is, uh, this is high high-level... Robert Altman, this is, you know, it lost to the Lord of the Rings. That was Return of the King year? Yeah. What else came out that year? Do you know? Do you have it in front of you? Uh, I mean, my phone's a little slow. If I remember that year, it was a good year for movies. Uh, and they just handed it off to Lord Mystic of the Rings. Mystic River came out that oh, year. It's a fantastic movie, too. Yeah. Ugh. Maybe you should stop. <laughs> <laughs> just gonna, I'm just going to get mad. My son in the car today goes, I want to see that movie with Grandolph in it. And I was like, what? <laughs> you started to watch it once and you got bored, remember? We had to watch it for the podcast a couple years ago. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Uh, I'm, still, I'm so mad now. <laughs> Lord of the Rings, Mystic River. Yeah, God. It's Be lost in translation. All right, Master and Commander. Stop. Master and Commander is fine. It's kind of Lord of the Rings in the ocean. Uh, All right, 1989. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> let's get let's cleanse our palate a little bit. Uh, four movies came out. I'll go through the ones that you didn't watch. A Dry White Season, you know that one at all? It sounds familiar, but I, I didn't get a chance to see it. What well, Eric the Viking. Ever heard Never of that heard one? of that. Welcome Home. From That's the that uh, Bruce Mil- Willis uh, Vietnam movie. Wasn't that, he's in two back-to-back movies, weeks. Is he? Well, last week he had a movie that came out, and you're like, "That's a Bruce Willis movie," and I looked it up, and it was. I thought we were looking ahead. When we said that we were looking ahead. Oh, that's very possible. Yeah. I yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's the uh, Bruce Willis Vietnam movie. His uh, family remembers him from back when or something. Yeah. Didn't watch it. That's okay. <laughs> I watched the only 89 movie that matters. Ridley Scott at his peak. <laughs> Black Rain. Uh, the idea here is that uh, Nicolas Cage and Andy Garcia are cops who, uh, they corral a Yakuza criminal. Uh, they're going to take him back to uh, Japan, uh, even though they'd like to try him in New York. He uh, escapes immediately back out into uh Freedom, and they've got to track them down, despite uh, not being allowed to actually be cops in Japan. And uh, they still act like cops. <laughs> they still act like they, they they would if they were in New York City, which is kind of it's very funny in that way. Uh, Before all of you get too excited, he said Nicholas Cage. He meant Michael Douglas. <laughs> did I? Did I he Nicolas said Nicholas Cage? Cage and Andy Garcia. Oh, weird. Uh, That's okay though. You know what's funny about Michael Douglas is that as a kid, I used to think of Michael Douglas as this, you know as this like uh, debonair movie star. When you look back at Michael Douglas now from this day and age, he was really sleazy. <laughs> like everything he did was super sleazy. <laughs> I've always like, I, I, other than this movie, like the plot of every Michael Douglas movie is basically every woman wants to sleep with him to the point of criminal behavior. <laughs> like the three movies as a I hate to say kid, but as like a teenager that stuck out of my mind, it was Fatal Attraction, Basic Instinct, and Disclosure. Those were the three that I knew him right. from. And then obviously there was this, and then even Wall Street, he plays a dick. And 
I mean, the best thing he ever did was like produce one full of the cuckoo's nest. Yeah, that's basically. <laughs> he's really not that great of an actor. <laughs> no, I mean, when you get down to it, he's super, super sleazy. It's disgusting, really. Uh, the, the, <laughs> this movie, at the very least, uh, they don't have Kate Capshaw just throw herself at him. I guess that's nice. Um, but of course, every woman in this movie is a whore because that's this that's 1989 in a nutshell, I guess. Uh, but uh, he's you know he's tracking him down. Andy Garcia gets his head cut off in a very boring scene. I was really hoping for more out of that. Well, I'm sorry for building that up. I was eight or whatever when I yeah. saw it accidentally <laughs> in a friend's house. I mean, I watched it then, and I, I thought I remembered that too, but it was not as. Impressive as I remembered it, either. Well, you also just watched Rambo. <laughs> I know you saw Rambo last. I'm just saying. <laughs> In that movie, a guy's head gets to, no, never mind. <laughs> like five guys' heads get cut off. <laughs> <sighs> I'm surprised there wasn't a scene in Rambo, just to digress a moment, where he just grabs a guy's neck and just rips the head right off. Like, that scene didn't happen. Right, and even the heart pulled out scene, like, yeah, at least they cut it out, but it's like, I'm surprised he didn't just shove his fist through there. <laughs> like, hot shot style. Right. <laughs> what I really want to see in, like, 20 or 30 years is Macaulay Culkin remake this movie, like, shot for shot with <laughs> Kevin McAllister. Because like, it really is Home Alone. It really is. He doesn't do, other than, you know, snapping a bone here and there. You know, get rid of the whole plot. Just get them into his caves underneath the ground that we forgot to talk about. When did he build those, by right? the way? <laughs> Ten years is a long time when to put that why? together. He likes and, digging. And who has the... What horse farmer has the money to build an entire forge underground? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or what v- Vietnam veteran uh, who clearly never had a real job because he's been drifting all over the place. <laughs> Every movie, they got to bring him out of whatever broken... <laughs> mindset he's in <laughs> and even uh, having horses where do you get the money right. for that anyway black rain yeah black rain uh, is uh i mean it's typically 80s you know you know where this is going there's no surprises there's no real suspense to it it's just michael douglas being pissed off and uh yeah have you ever done a movie with stallone michael douglas i don't think so no, he's too much of an he's too much of an egotist to share the screen with a star as big were. as him. They all were back then. Yeah. That's why you never saw Bruce Willis or Arnold Schwarzenegger and Stallone in the same movie until until they were expen- desperate, right? <laughs> and then even then, Bruce Willis bitched. <laughs> <sighs> How are we with time? Who battery's low? Forty six minutes. All right, that is the show. Next week. Uh, which we're going to record in about five minutes. We've got Game Changers. Stop fa- breaking the magic. A Fathom Event movie. <laughs> There's no magic. <laughs> Villains. Uh, I believe that comes out. Sean possibly here, but probably select cities. Sean has seen that. We'll talk about that. And then we're going <laughs> we're gonna to talk about the Rob Zombie Firefly, Firefly trilogy, which I think Sean thought he was being nice to do that for me, but he's just going to make fun of me for <laughs> three movies. Uh, <laughs> Chicken fucker. <sighs> sorry sorry I'll pretty save funny it. i'll save it <laughs> uh that will be next week uh and then we're not gonna talk about abominable because i don't care <laughs> uh and you want to play a little flick chart before yeah, we run out of not? time we'll play into the battery times <laughs> clueless blair witch project clueless Man, it's Blair Witch for me. me I love Blair Witch, out. but uh, Clueless is, is I, really fun. It was the first time I ever fell asleep in a theater. <laughs> Not the movie's fault. I was tired. It's George doing it on the floor. For... I never picked it up from last week when I dropped it. <laughs> Clueless wins. George does not like me. I think you've won the majority of our disagreements. <laughs> Phantom of the Opera 2004, Spartacus 1960. Spartacus. Yes. You were going fast for a while there, flick shirt. Don't you know my battery is low? <laughs> it's a race. Much Ado About Nothing, Bad Boys 2. Much Ado About Nothing. I, I hate Bad Boys 2. 
go with that. My boss's favorite movie, by the way. Bad Boys 2. <laughs> he loves it. It is amazing the amount of movies people like, and the it's. I mean, you sit there and you badmouth those Gerard Butler movies, but people love that shit. It's bizarre. I got a lot of hatred for how much I hate Gerard Butler. Airplane, Rosemary's Baby. <laughs> oh man, wow! Because they're so different, but they're so they're both incredible. Uh, they're masterpieces about what they're doing. Yeah. But I, I, I guess I like I a Rosemary's watch, Baby doing better. But I got to watch Airplane anytime. It's I'm going to watch Airplane f- more because it's easier. to yeah. Rosemary is long, but I like that the darkness so that I don't know. It's I like so Satan. exceptionally well directed too. Not to praise that guy, but <laughs> you mind. can't change the fact that Rosemary's Baby is exceptionally directed. So is Chinatown. I know. I know. Uh, airplane for me. All right, we'll flip it. I almost dropped it again. <laughs> Airplane. Scream 3, 101 Dalmatians, 1996. Boy, I mean, <laughs> might as well put a bullet in my head. Um, Dalmatians. Scream 3 is terrible. Right, I mean, at least it was... Dalmatians accomplished what it was trying yeah. to, at least. Horrible Bosses Grindhouse as a Collective. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess, uh, I guess, yeah, Tarantino's movie Death Proof is is good enough to beat Horrible Bosses on its own. And I'm okay with Planet Terror. <laughs> it's trying to be a terrible horror movie, and I'm giving us wrong with Planet that. Terror. I hate it. It's so gross, <laughs> disgusting. I hate it. I'm okay with gross and disgusting. Serenity 05, Babes in Toyland 97. Uh, Serenity, obviously. Yeah. I'll go with that. That's fine. The Matrix Moon. Uh, uh, controversial, but I go with The Matrix. I'd go with Moon. Come on, right, George. George. Do the right thing. This will be the one time Josh is like, no, George, go with Sean. <laughs> and he does. The Matrix. The Descent Wanted. Oh, The Descent all the way. That is such a great movie. If you've not seen The Descent, you've got to see that movie. That is a that is a truly exceptional horror film. One of those theatrical experiences you just want to have. You want to be able to redo. Yeah. Oh, what a, what a great experience that was in the theater. He didn't... I mean, you knew it was a horror movie. You didn't really see it coming. I don't know. It just really... I don't know. Every horror movie can really get you like that. that that's saying something. Cape Fear 91, The Whole Nine Yards. The Whole Nine Yards. I'll agree with that. Here's... Wow. Fargo, L.A. Confidential. <laughs> it's Fargo, but it's close. Man, my whole life it was L.A. Confidential, probably, with Fargo being... but. As of late, you know, especially since we, I think we, I don't know if we watched it for the show or not, but for a reason I watched it within the last couple of years. I think it is Fargo. But I don't know. The Coen brothers just get better with every viewing. It's true. Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, The Truman Show. The Truman Show. Yeah. The Lego movie, Gone Girl. Gone Girl. Free Willy Training Day. Training Day. My Best Friend's Wedding Collateral. Collateral. Although I don't hate My Best Friend's Wedding. Collateral's really good, though. It is. Especially for a Michael Mann movie. Man from Reno, 2014, and K-Pax. I'm not sure I know the Man from Reno. Good, because I've never seen it either. Swordfish, (laughs) K-Pax. It's easy for me. It's swordfish, but for the wrong reason. <laughs> swordfish is fun too. <laughs> oh, the only, you know, perversion is the only thing that elevates either of those piece of shit movies. 
<laughs> She's the only thing that matters in, in neither of those movies. <sighs> I've said it on the show before, but it's been a few years. When I went to the theater with my brother and we watched that, when she pulls the book down, he just goes, all right, we can go now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty packed theater for one reason only. <laughs> Tron Legacy, Caddyshack. Uh, Caddyshack. Greed. The Abyss, 12 Angry Men, 1957. 12 Angry Men all the way. I don't understand why that's so good. <laughs> wow John dies at the end John Tucker must die <laughs> <laughs> it dies at the end that's a pretty fun movie yeah, I yeah. Oh, this isn't fair that's too easy Christmas Vacation or Kill Bill Volume 1 oh it's Kill Bill all the way I wish Kill Bill could kill the <laughs> Christmas Vacation Dragon Age Redemption Never I don't heard of know it. what the hell that is. The Exorcist, The Good Shepherd. Good Shepherd? <laughs> the Exorcist. Have you seen The Good Shepherd? Yes, I've seen movie. The Good Shepherd. Well, okay, <laughs> I understand that. But the Exorcist <laughs> is an all-time classic that you just happen to not like. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> George! <laughs> 